Jesus Christ, the one who came to teach, heal, suffer, die, and rise from the grave only three days later, the one who ascended into heaven, and whose final words to his disciples were to go and make disciples of all nations. Immediately they began embarking on the great journey that was set out before them. They taught in his name, began building the first church, and coordinate the first missionary journeys. They helped the oppressed, stood up to the heretics, and through the grace of God, befriended their worst enemies. They were sojourners, they were poor, and they suffered more than most. They were common men who had no business carrying out the teachings of Jesus other than the direct orders from the Messiah himself. The new church began to form. New believers were being called to Christ every day, and the Great Commission was being fulfilled. This is their story. These are their acts. What a great time of worship this morning, and today I know is a very emotional day uh, for many of you. I had three graduate. I remember this day. And seeing my kids on that slideshow and the, all the emotions that you feel as your children are moving on to a different phase of their life, as many of you are. And we love you, and uh, we're so thankful that you have been able to be a part of our student ministry and our church, and we're excited about the things that God has for your future, and definitely praying for you as you head off to new adventures, whether that's college or the workforce or wherever God may be calling you to do. But uh, this morning, I want to share a word to not only our graduating seniors, but all of us. Uh, we are studying together the book of Acts. I love this book. And this morning, I want to invite you to open your Bible to Acts 3, verses 11 through 26. And this morning, a very timely message. I want to talk to you about sharing Jesus with others. You know, from time to time, we've all blown it, haven't we? We've had those moments where we feel the nudge, we feel the Holy Spirit kind of nudging us to share with someone, to witness to someone, to share our faith with someone, and uh, we, we cop out. You know, we let pride, we let fear, we make excuses, and we don't do it, and afterward, we, we feel it. We kind of feel that that, that twinge in our heart, man, I, I know God was leading me uh, to witness right there. You know, witnessing and sharing our faith is one of the most important things we do. Having gospel conversations or sharing Jesus with others is one of the great priorities in our life. If you were to put it on a scale of 1 to 10 and say 1 is the high priorities and 10 are the low priorities, Sharing our faith should be number one. That should be one of the greatest priorities of a believer's life. Every born-again believer, whether you're a child or adult or anywhere in between, should have a conviction about how important it is to witness and share our faith with other believers. The sad reality is, is that many believers never do share their faith, but it is our mandate in Luke 24, verse 46 through 47, this is the Great Commission according to Luke. And Jesus in his resurrected body before he ascended back to the Father, Jesus said, Thus it is written that, that the Christ should suffer, and on the third day he would rise from the dead, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. So who are the ones that should proclaim the name to Jesus to all nations? That's us. That's what God has called us to do. That's our mandate. In Acts 1.8, we studied this at the beginning of our study of Acts. Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. And so we're empowered for this. The Holy Spirit 
comes inside of all of us and he empowers us for one main priority, to be his witnesses all over the world. In our text this morning, Peter, who had recently denied Jesus three times, boldly proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's interesting that that it was Peter these two times now, in Acts 2 at Pentecost and here in Acts 3 after the lame man at the beautiful gate had been healed and the crowd gathered. It's Peter who for a second time proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ because it had not been long since he had blown it. He had an opportunity those three times to be a witness for Christ, and he denied him. He said, I I don't know that man. And maybe it was that transformation that took place in in Peter's life after Jesus rose from the dead. And now he's trying to make up for all the times that he's blown it, and, and he stands up and boldly proclaims Jesus. But before we condemn Peter for his denial, think about this with me. The main thought I want to share with you today is that every day we have the choice to either deny him or to share Jesus with others. That's the choice we have every day. We either deny him or we share Jesus with others. And you say, well, pastor, I don't really deny him. I mean, nobody ever really asked me if I'm one of those followers. I don't really deny him. But don't we? If we never share Jesus with someone, if it's never in our mind to witness and tell others about the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ, if we never feel that nudge and we never share Christ, aren't we denying Him? We have the choice. Every day that we live, we can either deny Him or share Him with others. And so with that in mind, Let's, let's look at God's Word in Acts chapter 3. Stand with me as we read God's Word to honor the ring of God's Word. You remember last week, Peter and John had been going to the temple, and uh, some, some men uh, carried their friend who was lame, crippled, and they laid him at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg for alms. And, and Peter and John uh, saw him, and fixed their gaze on him, and they said, you know, we don't have any silver or gold, but what we do have, we in the name of Jesus, we say, rise up and walk. And they reached down, and they took him by the hand, and he leapt up to his feet. He had been crippled for 40 years. God worked a miracle. He was walking and leaping and praising God. He went into the temple, and all the people saw him, and they were astonished. So let's pick up reading right there. It says, while this lame man who had been healed, clung to Peter and John. All the people were utterly astounded, and they ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. And he said, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this, and why do you stare at us, as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? For the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, And the God of Jacob and the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses." And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Christ has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, therefore, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ should suffer, he has fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you. 
Let's pray together. Oh, Father, thank you that you're a miracle-working God. And the greatest miracle of all is the miracle of salvation. When sinners like us can confess and repent of our sin and put our faith in Jesus and be forgiven, can receive those wonderful times of refreshing, and Jesus comes to us and lives inside of us and gives us new life. The author of life gives us new and eternal life. God, thank you. We praise you. And we accept the commission to be your witnesses to the end of the earth. God, teach us about that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So every day we have a choice to either deny him or to share Jesus with others. That's the main point I want to share with you this morning. As we think about that, I want to address all of our graduating seniors because every year that we see kids graduate and move off to college, my heart has different feelings. You know, one, I'm excited for you. It's a great time in your life, but I'm also very concerned for you because what we see not only here sometimes, but literally all over the world is teenagers grow up in a great church, and we do have a great church and a great student ministry, and teenagers are grounded in the Word of God. They build Christian friendships. They have opportunities to go on mission trips and ministries all over the world, And, and we as a church, and many of you as families, you've done everything in the world to prepare them for the next part of the journey. But awaiting on the next side of the journey are temptations and trials and things that maybe uh, you've never faced before to the degree that you will face them. And and when you go to college or you go off to a profession, whatever it may be, you're going to have the choice. You're either going to deny Jesus are you going to share Jesus with others? So many times when we go to college, we deny him. We forget that we ever knew him. We get caught up in the partying and the drunkenness and the revelry and the sexual immorality of a college atmosphere. And, and it's like we were never trained for this. We were never prepared for this. We were never grounded in God's Word. And oh, it breaks my heart. It makes me weep when I see teenagers and young people that had every opportunity to go and do great things for God, but they can't handle the environment of a college campus. When you think about it, our college campuses are the greatest mission fields there are maybe in America today. And my prayer for you is that you go there to not deny Christ, but to be a witness for Christ that you go there to share Christ with others, that you go there to be an ambassador of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And you've got to make your mind up. You've got to know before you go what you're going to be. You're either going to deny him or you're going to be his ambassador. And mom and dad, it really helps when you have been an example, when your kids have seen your courage in sharing your faith, when they've seen dad witness to others, and mom witness to others, and they've seen us not deny our faith when we go to work or when we're with others, but we share Jesus Christ. When you think about sharing Jesus with others, there are three things we do. We inform, we warn, and we invite. We inform them, we share with them about who Jesus is. Many people may not really know who Jesus is. We warn them of the consequences of sin, of the result of sin, of the consequences of rejecting Jesus, and then we invite them to put their faith in Jesus. We're going to see this beautiful outline in the Apostle Peter in our text this morning. So, number one, the first thing we do when we share Christ with others is we inform others of the facts about Jesus. That's what witnessing is. It's not our job to convert anybody. That's the Holy Spirit's job. My job is to tell the facts about Jesus, to share the good news about who Jesus is 
and what Jesus Christ came to do and what he will do in your life if you trust him. And this is exactly what Peter does. In verse 11, it says, While this uh, man who had been healed clung to Peter and John, all the people that saw this man healed were utterly astonished, and they ran to them in the portico called Solomon's. Solomon's portico or Solomon's porch or colonnade was a beautiful part of Herod's temple. may have been one of the most beautiful parts. It was this long colonnade that was a place where the early church and the Jews gathered on the east side of the temple, uh, out, just outside of uh, the court of the Gentiles. Uh, the column was made of marble columns. I think there was 160 of them. Uh, it was 800 feet long. The columns were 40 feet high, and it was covered by cedar wood. So this was a, a very nice place. In the gospel in John 10, we read about Jesus walking here in Solomon's porch. In, uh, in, Act, in Acts 5, the early church gathered there. And so this is where they were. Peter and John and this lame man who had been healed had made their way here to a place where many gathered. And all the people that heard about the miracle were running to see it. And this was the opportunity for Peter in this beautiful place to share his faith. So when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, said, Men of Israel, why are you wondering about this? Why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power, our piety, we have made this man walk? And so that was his transition. He's transitioning by asking them a question. Why are you amazed that this man has been healed? When we share the gospel, and we should share it all the time, we have to transition into the gospel. And when you have a friend, a family member, someone you're close to, the greatest way to transition is just be honest. And just say, hey, you know, you and I have been friends a long time, or you've been in my family a long time, and I don't know if I have ever taken the time to share with you about how important my faith is to me and the difference my faith has made in my life. May I ha would, you, would you let me just take a moment and share that with you? I mean, that's a great way just to be right up front and honest. Let it come out of your love. I love you. You're my friend. I care deeply about you. You're my family member. You're my brother. You're my sister. You're my aunt, my uncle. I had the privilege of leading two of my uncles to Christ when they were in the hospital, and it was they were very bad health. I didn't, we didn't know if they were going to live or die. And I did that very thing. I visited them in the hospital, and I said, Uncle Hen, his name was Henry. I called him Uncle Hen. I said, Uncle Hen, I love you. You've been my uncle. And, you know, I don't think I've ever shared with you how important my faith is with me. And, and you know, I know you're very sick, and I'm praying for you to get well. But can I share with you how important my faith is to me? He said, yes. And I was able to lead my Uncle Henry to faith in Christ right there in his hospital bed. He died not long after that, and I know he's in heaven today because right there he accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior. A few years later, my Uncle Virgil, same thing. He was in the hospital with kidney failure. I went to him. I said, Uncle Virgil, I don't know if I've ever shared with you how important my faith is to me, but can I just share with you? I shared with my Uncle Virgil, and he prayed to receive Christ. He got well, and I had the joy of seeing him baptized, I had the joy of going to his home and reading the scripture with him and discipling him. And, and so that's just a great way to do it. Just be honest. I'm your friend. I love you. I care about you. I've never shared with you how important my faith is with me. Uh, could I do that? What if it's a stranger? What if you feel the spirit tug? You feel that nudge that there's a stranger and you just feel like God's urging you to witness to them. Well, a transition I love to use is... I feel the nudge, so I'll just say, hey, you know, I, I don't know why this is, but, you know, I just feel like God wants me to pray for you. I just felt like there, there's something that, that I, I should pray for you about. I believe in the power of prayer. Could I pray with you? Now, if it's a stranger, they may look at me and say, no, <laughs> you can't pray for me. I don't even believe in God, and I think you're a weirdo. I mean, I, I don't want you to pray for me. Well, then I'll know. I'll know that... You know, I, okay, I was obedient to God. I don't need to go any further with this. I don't want to push. 
but that's rare. Most of the time, most of the time, people say, well, wow, that's, that's amazing that you felt that urge to pray for me because I, have a, I do have a, something I'd love for you to pray for me about. If they allow me to pray for them, well, then I think probably I can move on and say, well, can I share with you about how important my faith is to me and I can share the gospel with them? So whether it's with somebody I'm a family member to that I love and know or whether it's an absolute stranger, I can share the gospel by being polite and kind and making transitions. And, and, and those are things we should be sensitive to. I believe the Holy Spirit of God would have us witness more than we do. Amen? We're going to see in the book of Acts as we continue this journey that there were many different people that God nudged them to go witness, and they did. But yet we've put cotton in our ears. We've shut our ears to the Holy Spirit. We've gotten so busy, preoccupied with selfishness and pride, we're not even conscious of that. We don't even think about opportunities around us to share the gospel. Peter did. And so notice Peter. He's going to begin to inform the people about who Jesus is. And the first thing he's going to do is share about who he is. He, he's going to do three things as he informs the people the facts about Jesus. Number one, he's going to share who he is. And he's going to use terminology that the Jews understand because his audience is, is Jews. Remember, we're still in Jerusalem right now. And, and so he, he says to them uh, that Jesus is the, the servant. He, he uses the name the servant Jesus. Now, that was a messianic term. The servant was a messianic term. The Jews were looking for a Messiah that would be a servant. That came from Isaiah, as, as he talks about in verse 13, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of your fathers, glorified his servant Jesus. And now he's going to be a prosecuting attorney, and he's going to make his case really well. You delivered him over and denied him in the presence of Pilate when even Pilate wanted to release him. Even the pagan ruler Pilate wanted to let him go, but you wanted him to be convicted. So he's, he's sharing who he is, and he at the same time is like a prosecuting attorney, showing that they denied him. And in Isaiah 52, verse 13 Isaiah is, is giving prophecy and says, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. So the servant Messiah was something the Jews knew about. In Isaiah 53, this is the clearest prophecy we have of Jesus. It says, This servant was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his stripes or his wounds we are healed he says all we like sheep have gone astray we've turned everyone to his own way and the lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all so man peter being masterful witness is taking their scripture their prophecy and he's communicating to them who the servant jesus is and describing the cross that Jesus was crushed and bruised and beaten for our sins, that we like sheep have gone astray, but on the cross of Christ, God laid on him the sins of us all. Now, in the New Testament, in Matthew 20, verse 28, the Bible says, Jesus said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So he was the servant Jesus. So when we tell people about who Jesus is, who was Jesus? Well, he was God's servant. He came to die for us. He came to give his life for us. Well, the second thing we do is, is or the second thing Peter did was he talked about Jesus as the holy and righteous one. This is the second name he gave. He says, but you denied, again, he's the prosecuting attorney, you denied the holy and righteous one, and you asked for a murderer to be granted to you. Who was that murderer? His name was Barabbas. And, and they had a choice to either let Barabbas be released or Jesus be released, and, and they, they asked for Barabbas to be released. 
And Peter's saying, you guys, you, you ask for a murderer instead of the holy and righteous one. Another messianic term. The Bible says in Psalm 1610, For you will not abandon my soul in Sheol, or let your holy one see corruption. The Messiah was the holy one. And when Jesus appeared, even the demons knew who he was. One day Jesus was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum, and there was a demon-possessed man in the crowd, and the demon-possessed man in Luke 4, 34 said, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Demons knew that he was the Messiah. He was the Holy One of God. And so Jesus was perfect. He never sinned. He could die for us because he was the Holy One of God. And we're not holy. We're sinful. And then the, th the third way he described him is that he's the author of life. And now he drives the nail in the coffin as the prosecuting attorney. He says, you killed him. <laughs> you killed the author of life. How do you kill the author of life? They crucified him. But God raised him from the dead. And to this we are witnesses. In other words, he's saying, you know he's risen. The tomb is right out there. You, you, you are some of the witnesses. You know he's risen from the dead. And, and so when we share our faith, we, we share about these things. He was the author of life. We can use the New Testament, John 1, 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. In Jesus was life. In John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And what did Jesus do to prove that he's the resurrection and the life? He raised Lazarus from the dead, who had been dead four days. He's the author of life. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so when we share our faith, we don't have to share exactly the way Peter did. Because he was speaking to a Jewish audience, but we share the facts about who Jesus is. If I'm talking to somebody about Jesus, I'll say he was the Son of God. He lived on earth. He became a man. He lived a perfect life. He was God in the flesh. He was the author of life, and he never sinned. And he was willing to give his life for us. And so we share about who he is. The second thing is, we share about what he did. What did Jesus do for us? Well, in verse 15, Peter said, you killed him, so Jesus died for us, and God raised him from the dead. Those are the components of the gospel. If I were to ask you, church, what is the gospel? If I were to say, what are the basic components of the gospel of Jesus Christ? If you're going to share the gospel, what are the basic components? What would you say? Well, Paul helps us out with that, made it very clear. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Paul says, Now I'll remind you, brothers, of the good news, the gospel that I preach to you, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. So what are the components of the gospel? There are three basic components. What are they? Christ died for our sin. He was buried. And he, say it with me, rose again the third day. You say, well, Pastor, you know, I would witness, but I really, I really don't know what to say to people. I, I don't know what the gospel is. Well, now you do. I mean, this is it. The beautiful simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is that Christ died for my sins and he was buried and he rose again the third day. And we share what he did. We share who he is, we share what he did, and then we share about the difference he makes. And oh, what a difference he makes in our life. Amen? I mean, I could have you start standing up right now and I could say, hey, tell me about the difference Jesus has made in your life. And man, there would be story after story. For me, I was a teenage alcoholic headed for a dark and dismal life. 
and he set me free, gave me life, forgave my sins, gave me a future and a hope. And for many of you, it'd be something different. For this man, he had healed him. Look, Peter is going to share the lame man's testimony. He said in verse 16, And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. So whatever you are dealing with today, Jesus Christ is the answer. He can heal you. He can set you free from drugs. He can restore your marriage. He can take away the darkness of your heart. He can wash away all the guilt that that constantly follows you around every day. I mean, Jesus Christ makes the difference in your life. And and the joy and the peace and the purpose and the eternal life he brings, we all have a testimony. And one of the greatest things we share is our testimony. So if I was witnessing to someone today, I'd do exactly what Peter did. I'd tell him who Jesus is. I'd tell him what Jesus did. And I would tell him about the difference Jesus made in my life. And so the first thing we do is we inform. Then what do we do? We warn. The second thing is that we warn them. We warn others of the result of sin. Now, this is the thing that in our day and time, many want to skip over this one. We we don't want to talk about this. We want to just talk about the good news, but not the bad news. And there's a problem with that. Because you, you see, until you realize you are lost, you don't need a Savior. If you don't think anything's wrong with you, you don't realize you need salvation. And so there's no really sharing the gospel without warning people of of the result of their sin. And Peter does this well. Peter is going to go to the Old Testament, to to their Torah, the Pentateuch, the five books that they read, and he's going to use Deuteronomy, and, and he's quoting from Moses... And, and in Deuteronomy, he says, quoting, in, this is our, in verse 22 of our text, but he's quoting from the Old Testament, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses said. He will raise up a prophet like me from your brothers, and you will listen to him in whatever he tells you. So Peter's saying Moses was talking about the Messiah. And then he said this, and it shall be that every soul that does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. I mean, very straight to the point. God's going to raise up a prophet, a Messiah. You're either going to listen to him or not. And if you don't, you'll be destroyed. That was Deuteronomy 18, 18, and 19. Almost a direct quote. So he used the Old Testament. Could we make the same point from the New Testament? Yeah, easily. Romans 3, 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23. The wage of sin is what? Death. Eternal death. Separation from God. But the free gift of God, hallelujah, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so as I tell people, inform them about who Jesus is, and I have to also warn them of the result of their sin, that the reason Jesus did this is because you're a sinner. And if, if you don't let Christ... Take away your sins, the wages is eternal death. Stephen Cole, a pastor, I love his words here. This is a great quote. He said, many modern preachers try to tiptoe around the matter of sin and guilt. They don't want to offend people. But if we omit sin and guilt, then there's no need for a Savior. Jesus didn't die on the cross for pretty good folks so that they could feel better about themselves and to help them succeed in life. He died for them because they are sinners who are under God's wrath and judgment. Without a Savior, they face both physical death and the second death, eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. And that is truth. That is reality. That is Bible truth. 
no matter how in intelligent or how sophisticated or modern we think we are, we cannot get away from the reality that there is a heaven, that God loves us and wants us to go there. And Jesus died on the cross so we could go there. And there is a hell, a lake of fire. And if we deny Christ and reject Christ and turn our back on Christ, then the result of sin is eternal separation from God. And if that doesn't move you, you don't care about people. If you don't care uh, that they're going to face the fate of not only a life that's miserable without God, but an eternal life that's even of greater misery, then how do we love our friends? How do we love our family? How do we love a lost and dying world? We have to share both the good news about who Jesus is and the bad news about the consequences of sin. The third thing and the final thing we do is we invite. We inform, we warn, and we invite. Once you warn somebody of the consequences of rejecting Christ, don't leave it there. I mean, don't, don't stop right there. Invite them to put their faith in Jesus. Make the invitation. So many times we witness and we stop at the most important point. We don't make the invitation. We don't invite them. Peter invited this crowd to repent and turn to Jesus. So we must invite others to repent and turn to Jesus. In verse 19 and 20, he said, Repent, therefore, and turn back, turn back to Christ, that your sins, and he's already pointed out how great their sins are. I mean, they rejected Christ, denied Christ. They would rather have a murder than Christ. These sins can be blotted out. The word blotted out means erased. I mean, totally erased, eradicated, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Christ appointed to you, Jesus. And, and so, so he invited them right that very moment to make that decision. And so likewise, you invite somebody. And, and what do you do after you invite somebody? You wait. There could be that long, uncomfortable moment of silence where they're just sitting there, not saying anything. And your temptation is to fill that gap. Oh, man, this feels uncomfortable. I, I better say something else. Don't. Because the Holy Spirit is at work. The Holy Spirit brings conviction. So just let that pause be as long as it takes for the Holy Spirit to do the work. And then that person may say something like, man, I'm ready. Thank you for sharing. What do I do? Or they may say, I'm not ready yet. Man, thank you for sharing, but I'm not ready yet. And then, you know, you have to, you have to let them go. You plant a seed. You have to let somebody else finish it. The word metanoio is the Greek word for repent. And that, that is a key word in the gospel. And it's a word we often leave out. We often just say, well, just believe in God. But nowhere in the Bible does it say that we can be saved apart from repentance. Repentance means to change one's mind or purpose about sin. It doesn't mean you just feel sorry about your sin, but it means you change your mind about it. It means I don't want to live in it anymore. I don't want to follow that anymore. I, I want to change my purpose. And I'm going I'm to turn my back on it. And, and it, it means a change of mind that issues in a change of behavior. And, and, and repentance is the first word of the gospel. Peter said it in Acts 2.38. Remember, Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. You'll receive the Holy Spirit. How many, how many of them in that crowd repented? 3,000. And they baptized them in those mikvahs, remember? In those baptistries. And, and what a day that was. Acts 2, Acts 20, 21, Paul said the same thing. He said, I went everywhere. I proclaimed it publicly and house to house. What did he proclaim? Testifying both to Jews and Greeks, repentance toward God, and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. 
My friends, it doesn't matter who you are, you can't go to heaven and spend eternity with God without repentance. You can't just live the way you want to live and say, but I believe in God. I believe that Jesus died for me, so I'm going to go to heaven. Whoever told you that lied to you. And someday you're going to stand before a holy God when you die, and, and you're going to say, well, aren't you going to open the gate? And he's going to say, who, you, who are you? I'm sorry. I, I never knew you. You cannot be saved without repentance. There has to be an awareness that your sin is something that grieves the heart of God. And you don't want the sins of your life to be a barrier between you and God anymore. You want to walk away from them. That doesn't mean that you're going to be a perfect, spotless person. You'll still make mistakes along the way. But you don't want that anymore. You walk away and you put your faith in Jesus Christ. When you do that, when you repent and turn back, then you have genuine salvation. What happens when genuine salvation occurs? Well, your sins are blotted out, number one. Hallelujah. I mean, every sin you've ever committed from day one to the day that you live, no matter how dark, they're washed away, they're covered, they're removed as far as the east is from the west, they will be remembered no more. And then times of refreshing come. Do you remember the time you first gave your life to Jesus and you felt the, the um, incredible lifting of all your sins, all your sins being washed away? There's nothing in the, in the world that compares to that. All that filth, all that grunge, all that guilt that's built up over the years in one instant in the miracle of faith and repentance is washed away. You never get over that. I'm still not over it today. I worship. I, I want to share with others. I want others to experience the refreshing joy of knowing salvation. And then he said that he may send the Christ appointed for you. I mean, Christ comes to live within our hearts, gives us new life. His Spirit will be with us forever. It just doesn't get any better than that. And so every day, beloved, you have the choice. You're either going to deny Jesus, you're going to walk through life and never witness to a soul, never share faith with anybody. That's the same thing as denying Him. Or you're going to share Him with others. I pray that you will. Sharing Jesus means we inform, we warn, and we invite. Now, once we make the invitation, it's no longer in our hands. Whether that person wants to receive Christ or is not ready yet, that has no bearing on me whatsoever. My job is merely to inform, warn, and invite. Their decision is in God's hands. And so if they say, well, I'm not ready yet, or I don't want that, that's not be between me and them. That's between them and God. I've done my job, and now I will have to let them make their decision, let somebody else come along and witness to them. Or maybe God will give me another opportunity at a later date. But I have to respect their decision. I can't beg them or try to continue to try to twist their arm. It's not my job. I've made the invitation, they reject Christ, that's between them and God. When they accept Christ, then I don't take any credit for that. I mean, it wasn't me. I just simply did my job, informed, warned, invite, and the Holy Spirit convicted them and drew them to Christ. And this is our job. I pray that we will do it. I love this tool. This is a tool we use. Here at North Park, these Bibles, these are a great tool. It comes with a Bible, a little business card, and an armband. And I have used all three of these to share Christ. And this has the Bible verses marked that we can use to inform people about Jesus, to warn people of the results of sin, and to invite people to repent and turn. 
And these Bibles are out in our, bo- in our coffee shop. We'll give them to you for free if you'll use them. If you'll use them. Now, we ask if, you're, if you can to give a $5 donation so we can continue to replenish them. But whether you give us a $5 donation or not, it's not important. What's important is that you use it to share the gospel. What if, as a church, every one of us said that once a week, I'm going to buy one of these. I'm going to invest $5 a week, if you want to, or just, if you don't have it, take it. And say, my goal every week is to give one of these away. My goal every week is to share Christ with someone this week using this tool. Next Sunday, you come back, you get another one. Next Sunday, you come back, you get another one. One time a week. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what God would do? What if you did that, teenager? What if you took the bands and the cards and you go to college and say, hey, it's my mission field. I'm not going to go there and deny Christ. I'm going to go there and take as many people to heaven with me as I can. What was the result? I'm going to give you a preview of next week's sermon, all right, and then we're going to be done. In Acts 4, after Peter, Peter gave the invitation, what happened? Well... As, as, as they were speaking to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came, and they were greatly annoyed. <laughs> Great, right? That really encourages me. I mean, they shared the gospel, and there were some people that were greatly annoyed. Sometimes you share Christ with somebody, they're going to be greatly annoyed. They're, gonna not, they're not going to appreciate it. They're, they're, they're going to be angry because you confronted them with the greatest thing in the world. It's going to happen. Next thing that happened was this. They were arrested and put in jail. They arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Praise God, we're not there yet. There are a lot of countries that are. There are a lot of guys out there like me and you, sharing Christ in other places. They're going to prison for sharing their faith. Some of them being martyred, even as I speak. Right now, we're not there. We have the opportunity to share freely. What was the third result? But many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. <laughs> Hallelujah! Hallelujah! 5,000. Man, those mikvahs were put back into business again, right? As baptistries, 5,000 men were receiving Christ, opening their heart to the gospel. That's the power of the gospel. It's going to offend some. It, It may bring some kind of consequence into your life. But if you share the gospel, hundreds or even thousands of people could be saved. It would be worth going to prison any day to see 5,000 people come to know Jesus Christ as Lord. Amen? And so, beloved church, let, let's, let's share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, do you realize, do you know that Jesus died for your sins? He did. Jesus Christ is God's Son, and He loves you, and He wants you to go to heaven. And he was willing to die for your sins on a cross so that you could be saved. Do you realize your need for forgiveness? Whether you realize it or not, your need for forgiveness is real. And if you deny Jesus and reject Jesus and you die in your sin, listen to this preacher tell you the truth. You will spend eternity in a place called hell. That is reality. That is truth. That's why Jesus died on the cross. There's no getting around it. Jesus didn't die just to make you a better person. He died to rescue you and save you from judgment and to make you a better person. And and there's consequences. Do you realize you need forgiveness? And would you like to repent, turn away, and turn to Jesus? If you do, I promise you, He'll forgive your sin. You will feel more joy and refreshment than you've ever known possible. 
And Christ Jesus will come and live inside of you. Would you bow with me? As we bow in prayer before God this morning, I just pray for our teenagers, for our graduating seniors. I pray this morning that this is not going to be a time in your life where you turn away. You get caught up in the atmosphere of the world. But I pray you leave here as a missionary, that you leave here on a mission, and that when you go to college or into the workplace, that you're going to go there to share Jesus Christ. And mom and dads, what about you? Our kids need to see me and you sharing our faith. And if you're here today, and you've denied Jesus more than you want to admit, maybe you just need to come to the altar this morning, get on your knees, and say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for all those times you've nudged me, and I made excuses, and I copped out. God, today I feel convicted, and I want that to change. And I want to be bold. Give me boldness. I want to share the gospel. Give me somebody that's weak. Maybe you're here and you're not saved. You came maybe to see a graduate. Church is really not your thing. God loves you. There's something better for you than sin and rebellion. There's a God who wants to have a relationship with you. And a God who wants to forgive your sins so that you can spend eternity with Him in heaven. And you can repent and turn to Him today. You say, Pastor, how do I do it? Well, just right there at your seat. You just say, God, I know it's me. I know I'm the one that was meant to hear this today. And I feel the conviction of your spirit. I feel you drawing me to Jesus. And I want to turn away from my sin today. And I want to trust Jesus as your Lord, as my Lord. Pray that. Just pray that. Call upon His name. In a moment, we're going to stand, we're going to sing, the altar will be open. If you want to come and pray at the altar, and I'll be right here. I'll be standing here waiting on you. And I'd love for you to come and take me by the hand and say, Pastor, it was me. Today, I've given my life to Christ. I want you to pray with me. I want to to profess Him as my Lord. I'll be right here. Come, don't wait. Come, come and pray profess Christ as your Savior. Father, I pray you speak. No one can be saved unless the Spirit draws. No one can be saved without His conviction. God, convict and draw people today. God, may I be challenged and our family today be challenged, our teenagers be challenged not to be deniers of Christ, to be people who share Christ. God, forgive us for all the times we have failed. And God, help us to change. And God, I pray that we will see the waters of baptism, the baptismal waters stirred here so often because our people are doing their job. God, speak to us today and lead us to do what you would have us do. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.